when God's word condemns the clergy, can the people trust their teaching? Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Larson. I'm with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, inviting you to our worship on Sunday. You can choose 8.30 or 10.30, either online or in person. We have a Bible study, and that's where we are now, 9.30 on Sunday morning. Or you can watch it anytime as I understand many people do, uh, by clicking on YouTube and going to a search box and putting in Pastor Larson's Bible study. I think you can find us there. You might try subscribing and then hit videos, and then it'll all appear in date order, the most recent on top. If you want to visit our church, the address is 400 North Swinton, Swinton and Lake Ida in Delray Beach. Well, hi, and we're looking at Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And there are some rhetorical questions that I have for you. These are not for your answering right away, class. Uh, how about, wouldn't you think that the men of, that God entrusted with the priesthood would be faithful to their calling? I would expect it. Wouldn't you think that people would always bring their first and best offerings to the Lord? I would think so. And wouldn't you think that God's people would want to keep his ordinance of marriage as he intended? I'm hinting at the subjects that Malachi uh, covers in the second part of chapter one and getting on into chapter two. Let's look at um, Malachi chapter 1, and I'm asking someone to read verses 4 and 5. Judy, you're up. Okay. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Great is the Lord, because he has done these things. This is the prophecy of destruction of the country of Edom, descended from Esau, another mm -hmm. name for Edom, which means red. So here are some uh, considerations. You may remember from last time or from your individual study that Malachi prophesied that Edom would be destroyed. Not only that, but Edom will never be reestablished. Edom becomes desolate, a desolate wasteland. The descendants were scattered all over the face of the then known earth. So this was a very difficult prophecy. It comes through Malachi. And then the prophet does not bring them up again. Let's move on to a more prominent subject in the book of Malachi, and that is that the priests have not been faithful. This is what the Lord has to say against the priests. Um, Chris, would you read? Yes. Um, chapter 1, 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priest, who despise my name? I'm sorry about that. Uh, but you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised that's hmm. pretty heavy isn't it oh yeah. yes pretty heavy the priests have not honored god they have despised meaning they showed contempt for the name of god as we have there in verse seven so what made their offerings polluted do you know some of you have read ahead in yeah. the book what caused their offerings to be called polluted. 
why yeah, were they? They, they offered animals that uh, were not pure. D, that's correct. Uh, what did the Lord require? Unblemished uh, animals. Un unblemished. So they were not offering their first and best. Now the table that is spoken about here is in verse 7. It was the altar. I think you figured that out. It was the altar upon which the priests made the offerings, the burnt offerings, when they were burned up in the fire. Now, Adi, would you go on and read verse 8? Okay, verse 8. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that you're... It's a verb, so it means present. present. Uh, thank you. Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Blind animals. How had the priest polluted the altar? Well, the Lord gives his answer here. Uh, then he is sarcastic. The Lord is sarcastic as he speaks through Malachi. Well, try that with your governor. See if that gets you anywhere with him. <laughs> uh, there's a sense of humor there in a, in a negative way. Uh, if you bring an offering to the Lord and it is not acceptable to him, will you have his favor? With such a gift from your hand, in verse 9, will God show favor to any of you? No. Uh, it's a rhetorical question, but you know the answer, and they knew the answer was no, no. absolutely no. Who were bringing these lame and sick animals? Well, the, the uh, priests had to be accepting them from the people. And who were bringing them to the priests? Uh, were they the Israelites? The people who, to whom God had commanded, yes. you will bring an unblemished <laughs> offering. So you can see how the priests became willing participants in this son, in this sin, I'm sorry, by accepting them. They should have said, you turn around, go back home and get the sacrifice, the pure one, the, the unblemished lamb, goat, or whatever that you promised. So what does God require in verse 9? Unblemished sacrifices. Yes. And, I mean, in, obedience in, to follow what he's asked. The word entreat in verse 9, of course, means ask for. Ask for God's favor. When oh. you bring such an offering, it's a, a sarcastic thing. What do you think you're going to get? Oh. Yes. Now, the difficult question is to apply this to today's situation. Uh, sometimes money is called filthy lucre, but I'm not going there, and I'm not talking about the spores or the bacteria that might be on the money. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with that. But to what extent and to how would our offerings ever become polluted. I thought he would re take any anything we put in the offering plate, any any check that we wrote. Well, I would think if, if the money was um, was uh, earned in an unfavorable way, uh, not an honest way. Okay, that's illegal good. Illegal or stolen or um, I know there's even been question about people who say well, if I win the lotto, I'll give 10% to the church. Well, <laughs> I'm not so sure that there's been quite, that's been questionable too. Yeah, a man uh, got nearly a quarter of a billion dollars the other day. Mm. And uh, I was surprised that they published his name. Mm. <laughs> but uh, if you get um, money, as you say, in an illegal or in, uh, in a way that dishonors God, um, I, I'm going to tell you a story that goes way back. The, the stewardship department uh, of a church body 
uh, was trying to promote stewardship. And they were remembering what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians um, 8, I think it's 8 or maybe 9, a chapter. Um, God loveth a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. And you and I uh, attempt to give cheerfully, not mm -hmm. grudgingly, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So in order to pr promote stewardship, they were selling t-shirts online. Okay. And this is what the t-shirt says. God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll take money from a grouch. <laughs> okay. I think you see what's wrong with that. It's, it's making fun of scripture. The cheerfulness has to do with your heart. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we know that. And uh, the, the hilarious giver as sometimes it's translated, is the person who gives without fear of not having enough for their needs. You got it? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to apply here. Now give these gifts. And one more thing. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. It isn't that you are buying God's favor with your offering. That you could never do that because then his gift would not be by grace. It would be by works. You can't buy God. You can't leverage him. You can't put one over on him. This is God we're talking about. You understand, don't you? I'm sure you do. So that's how your offering could be polluted if you gave with, with the fear that you weren't having enough or that you, that you, you pledged a hundred dollars, but you had decided you would only give 80. Now, God, in your heart, you work that out. I don't have any laws for you. All right. You have any I, comments on that before we run up? No. no. <clears throat> okay. I'm not going to talk, talk about your offerings all day. I'm sure not. Okay. We're back to Judy uh, verses uh, 10 and 11, please. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. There's that refrain again. My name will be great among the nations. Now that mm -hmm. that word nations is important. It has a, a mission application. We're not talking about that today, but I want you to note that when, uh, when the Old Testament talks about God's people or Israel, mm -hmm. that's the nation of Israel. That's the chosen people, uh, beginning as, of course, with Genesis chapter 12. But when he says nations, that's everyone else. Now, let's look at some questions together. Okay. Why would God say shut the doors in verse 10? Yeah. Because he doesn't want them. He doesn't want what? Their ill-gotten uh, gifts um sacrifice yeah. and uh they might as well shut their doors they're not getting anywhere it would be it would be better for them not to get to get uh to receive anything if it wasn't a pure sacrifice than to receive a pure sacrifice they'd be better off to shut their doors okay good good okay, that's, that's, that's real good so that god is 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 making a a plea for them to come with an honest worship and an honest and devoted offering, uh, unpolluted, that is, pure. So then what does God, when does God refuse an offering? I've never found that tr true, that uh, the money never bounced, <laughs> bounced out of the plate. It, is, but it doesn't matter whether it goes into the church treasury or not. It's what God does with our offerings that make a difference in the world and in his church. Does God ever refuse an offering? He did then. 
when it was polluted. I don't want offerings that don't come from your heart and mm -hmm. which are not given according to the laws that I have laid down through my servant Moses. I don't want them. You might as well shut the doors. What oh, standards yeah. had the Lord laid down for the proper sacrifices? Do you know? I think we've talked about it, haven't we? We, we mentioned that, that it had to be an unblemished animal. I believe it had to be also a male animal. Yes. Well, wow. let's, let's look at uh, one of those verses from Leviticus 22, verse 22. Uh, Chris? Okay. Animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scab, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. I want you to remember that the uh -huh. priests made their living. That is, uh, they didn't get... They didn't get money. Okay. They received these food offerings for their sustenance. Now, I suppose, and I haven't read details <laughs> on this. Someone can correct me if they wanted to here. I don't know everything. I, uh, and, I, and I know that's not a surprise to you. But you, you could imagine that they could sell the excess Okay, if we get 212 tomatoes from our garden, <laughs> as we have in the last month, weighing, well, we just passed 100 pounds yesterday. Oh, my gosh. Um, I thought about, in a kidding way, that I'd put a table out in front of our house, and I would sit there <laughs> and sell them to passersby. I've seen people do that. Well, you see, then I could make my living by the offering that God gave me. <laughs> I'm going to go on and not talk about them, but we're going to boil down eight pounds more today. <laughs> Janie and I have been busy. Happily so. <laughs> okay. By the way, I have a question for you ladies. When you make a sauce out of tomatoes, do you keep the seeds in there? Mm -hmm. I usually put them through a colander and get try to get the seeds out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I read that they can make the sauce bitter, but we've had no trouble with them so far. And I've noticed that when I eat tomatoes, well, the, you know, the, the seeds go right in there. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's any food value. Not many, not many carbs there. <laughs> okay. That's enough of my, my, personal <laughs> tangent but i'm having fun and we are so blessed uh, i went out there when the when the uh, seedlings were planted and they were only a foot tall and i asked god to bless the work of our hands <laughs> oh, oh, well. you got what you asked for <laughs> yes yes and we've been giving them away uh anyway it's kind of fun to, to see what god can bring out of I think the total weight of the seeds that are in the ground might have been one gram. Mm. Wow. All the seeds. They're pretty light and small. Mm -hmm. But look at that. It's a parable. Well, mm -hmm. I want you to read again verse 11. Part, pardon me for my, I, I just have to bring up what God has done for me and for Jeannie and for the people. How does God <laughs> bring a polluted how does God, how does bringing a polluted offering detract from God's name? My name will be great. And a pure offering. Well, it's, it's like you're not giving him his best because he's considered the highest. And uh, you're just giving him um, sometimes like the leftovers or the that which isn't good and keeping the best for yourself instead of giving it to God. Sounds kind of selfish. You're not, you're not, you're not honoring him by doing so. And I'm showing your, showing your thanks for what he's done for us. Okay, good. Anyone else? Yeah. God is first. Okay. What is that word joy I heard this week? Uh, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, and why is yourself as last? <laughs> that may help. 
So what does the Lord have to say against the people? We've we've seen what he says against the priests. Now let's talk about the people. <clears throat> uh, who's next? Chris again? Or did you read? It's Dee's turn. Yes. Malachi chapter 1, 12. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit. That is, its fruit may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame, or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? It must have been hard to hear this. So what does it mean to profane God's name? I have trouble with that word profane. I try, what does that mean, profane? It's a lack of respect. Yes. Others? I, I think they call it, if you, if you were to swear in God's name, that's profaning God's name. To take it in vain, yes. <laughs> yes, I hear a lot of GDs in the world. Mm -hmm. Profanity. Yeah, it is. There you go. I think that helps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the word profane, I, you know, I push, I push shift F7 on the word processor and I get synonyms down the right hand side of the screen. And so I can, you know, I could look it up in a dictionary or a thesaurus. Do you know do you know what a thesaurus eats for breakfast? No. What would a thesaurus eat for breakfast? Cinnamons? A uh, cinnamon, a cinnamon, synonym cinnamon. roll, yes. Is cinnamon, yes, a, a <laughs> synonym roll. Cinnamon roll, okay. I got that in the email this week. Oh, really? A synonym roll. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, cinnamon. All right. Uh, so weariness in that in that verse, you say it's weariness. What a weariness this is. They're bringing their offerings, and the people are saying, "Ah, what a weariness this is." And I'm trying to figure out what does that mean. Well, it means tiresome or tedious, mm -hmm. something that is performed without faith, going through the motions. Are are we hitting any current? issues in worship today when we say that mm -hmm. do you remember the the thing that we would sing in matins um the te deum you don't remember that no well no. someone once mispronounced it and called the tedium oh, tedium. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay I think some people, you know, uh, some uh, some of the younger people feel that our traditional services are kind of you start going through the motions because everything is so much you say the same prayers and go right. through the same, you know, kind of a routine. Right. Uh, without and you it can do it almost mindless if you, you haven't brought your heart and mind to church with you. Well, you can say the Lord's Prayer mindlessly. You can say you can end up at the end of the Apostles Creed and realize that you were thinking about something else. Your eyes mm -hmm. were transmitting messages. Am I admitting something? Your eyes were transmitting messages to your your lungs and your mouth and everything that makes speech, but it wasn't going through your heart at all. Correct. It wasn't your faith that you were confessing. Well, I need to stop and think. And then there are all the tangents that are that come up. Mm -hmm. I heard someone say, I challenge you to say the Lord's Prayer without thinking of something that it reminds you of. Yes. You get to daily bread and you begin to picture the table laden with good things or the refrigerator or freezer mm -hmm. or what you were meant to take out for supper and you didn't. I'm talking about the frozen food. It, you just your minds are are built to to think of related things and right. to concentrate well my suggestion is slow down each petition 
and go ahead and think all you want about that petition. Concentrate on what it means. Okay. Does this apply at times to people who come to worship? That's what we've been talking about. I, I, think, right. I think it does. And I think sometimes, you know, when a service is um, changed a little bit from its routine, it kind of gives us a jolt to like pay attention right. all of a sudden as to what really is, what's really happening and why are you really there? That's a good question. Anyone else want to talk about that? <laughs> all right. And that means you have to work at it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not a purely passive thing that the words just sort of pass over you. Whether you're online or in person doesn't matter. I will admit that it's harder to concentrate watching it online. Yes, it is. And Jeannie and I did our first Sunday last week at uh, Trinity Lutheran Church after 13 months. Of course, I was there Monday, Thursday, but I'm talking about the Sunday with all the people present at the first service. So it was so good to be back. I can't tell you how good it felt. Uh, I'm not going to talk about my health now. Um, <laughs> this word snort, I don't know if the word snort is in the Bible very much, except with animals. Right. <laughs> it can also be translated sniff, and that didn't help me. I looked at several translations, and uh, it suggests that they scorned it. They groaned at it. What a weariness this is. I have to go through this again and bring these. All the time I bring these offerings, one after another. Oh, another day, another offering. Okay? You could understand that. Because you're a sinner, too. And I can understand that. Because... Mm -hmm. If you make your offerings automatic, it's hard to think of them as an act of worship. When I think of the word snort, I always think of the word pig. Right. <laughs> and I think, well, I guess that really lowers you into the mud, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, okay. In verse 13, what was wrong with the offerings the people were bringing? I think we have already discussed that, haven't we? Right. Yeah, they were impure. They were not perfect sacrifices. So how do the people describe their attitude toward their offerings in verse 13? Uh, I think we covered that too. Read verse 13? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't see that before. You bring what it has been taken by violence. Well, this animal was killed by someone last night, so I'll I'll bring that as my offering. I wasn't going to eat it, obviously, because it stayed outdoors and wasn't clean. Okay. It's it's like certainly, yeah, it certainly is showing not only uh, a disregard for the Lord, but you're showing a disregard for the uh, for the priests at, at back in those days in the uh, in the temple doing the sacrifices by bringing them sick animals or animals that were, you know, killed and not properly cleaned afterwards. I mean, you were not caring about them whatsoever. You could make them sick. A disregard for the clergy. Yes, for the so clergy if you, and their families. If you're bringing your gift to the altar and you remember that someone has ought against you, leave your gift at the altar and go and first be reconciled to your brother or sister and mm -hmm. then come and bring your offering. Okay. You see what can get in the way of an otherwise pure offering in our cases? That's Jesus speaking. Shall I accept that from your hand? It's ob obviously a rhetorical question, and the implied answer is, oh. no, I will not. Well, once in a while we get an illustration of uh -huh. someone who had a male in his flock and he vows it and then says, no, that's looks like a little wolf. <laughs> that's <laughs> and I, I vowed a, a, a perfect male and now I'm not going to bring it. I'm going to bring to the Lord what is blemished. 
The Lord says, I am a great king, and my name will be feared among the nations. So cursed be the cheat. You're cheating God if you don't bring him what is due to him. You think about it that way. And this is not a plea from the church to increase your offerings. We're studying Malachi chapter 1. And this is God speaking to the Israelites. But you can see the application in the 21st century. And I think that I can't judge your heart any more than you can judge my heart. You examine your own heart. Bring God the first and believe that if you bring him the first, you're, you're, the rest will be added to you. You see how that applied in the agricultural nations where you didn't have publics with more food than anyone could ever eat. Right. So that if you had the expectation that your ground would yield huh, 30, 60, 100 fold, <laughs> a 10,000 fold, that you would take the first bushel of tomatoes and bring it to the Lord. <laughs> well, we give in other ways, don't we? Amen. Well, how have the people been cheating the Lord? By bringing the blemished sacrifices. What kind of vow? We already covered that. A perfect one. So let's took, uh, take some time for some application. Look how the priests dare to argue with God. This is almost humorous, almost. But you say, how have you loved us? But you say, how have we despised your name? But you say, how have we polluted you? But you say, what, is, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it. What I've done is extract the people's responses to God's command, in, and I put them all together, all four of them. This is how the people have argued with God. So what would we call this dialogue, for example, if the dialogue that we've just read was between parent and child, with a child saying these things, or the, the adult acting like a child? What do, we, what do we call that? Disrespect. Disrespect. Mm -hmm. Dishonor. Argumentative. Listen, don't argue with me. I told you to go to your room and clean it up, and then we're going to talk about what you're asking. But I'm not even going to listen to your petitions, what you're asking me for, until you take care of that room. I know it's a cliched example. Certainly not honoring your mother and your father, according to the commandments. There's no honor. That's right. Thank you for bringing that up. No honor. So how should we respond when the Lord challenges us by quoting our foolish excuses and denials back to us. <laughs> Ouch. Right. I, it hurts. Go ahead. Only you can answer that question. I think we seriously have to sit down and take a look at our heart and where we're coming from and uh, examine, you know, are we really acting and doing this and not honoring God? Sometimes we can't, sometimes we certainly can't see our own, um, we can't see our own. Uh, Go ahead, call it a sin. Negative, negatives or, you know. Sin is right. Uh, things that all oh, we think we're doing, we think we're going along doing just fine and you know, being a good Christian when really we aren't honoring the Lord or even honoring and respecting our fellow Christians. Right, right. Dee, did you have something there? No. I thought I heard your voice. Okay. So responding with um, a contrite heart, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise, Psalm 51. It is, um, I'm sorry, Lord. I I'm sorry. Help me. So how should we show we have repented? By bringing 
what? Oh. Uh, an offering that is acceptable to the Lord. And in, uh, he, in uh, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, do you remember the sacrifice that we bring? It's a sacrifice of ourselves. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves. All right. Um, we have time to go into chapter two. How about that? Yes. Okay. okay. Let's keep going. The Lord has two charges against the priests, and this is a summary. They were corrupt in their instruction, and we'll look at those verses in detail, but this is the outline that covers chapter two, and divorce. Divorce. Did you know Malachi has something to say about divorce? Malachi is the prophet. The words are God's words. I know you always keep that in mind, but it's my job to remind us that this is God talking. So let's talk about the priests who were corrupt and who allowed divorce and themselves involved in those. So in this chapter, I'm numbering the questions for no particular reason. When a pastor is called to a congregation, what expectations do the people have for his instruction, his preaching, his teaching, and counseling? That they're true to the Bible? True to the Bible. Right. Um, what expectations? Um, I think we expect, I think we expect him to be an example if he is a married pastor, or even if he's not a married pastor, to be an example of, of, okay. of what I guess we would call a good Christian or a, 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 someone who loves God. Right. And as far as marriage, I think that in the old catechism, we use the word chaste. Yes. C-H-A-S-T-E. Faithful. Faithful to his, to his uh, spouse. Well, if he doesn't have a spouse, he is to be chaste in his sexual life. Yes. He's faithful to the church. All right. In particular, what expectations, and you already uh, got into this, what expectations should the people have about the pastor's teaching about his example for a godly marriage? Hmm. I'm sure he would follow what we, you know, what we read in Corinthians and in the Bible, and we go back to Leviticus about you know, that uh, a wife and a husband are male and female, and it's not other combinations into, you know, of uh, marriage. All right, good. Uh, as, God, as God, when he created Adam and Eve as a couple. That, that would be our expectations for the pastor who is called and installed, ordained, and picked out by God for this special service. It's uh, both exalting and humbling at the same time. It lifts us up as pastors and it keeps us in check, lest we, after preaching to others, may ourselves be found to be castaways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, you know, I don't know where this might come in, but since we are the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, there are... Um, foundations that have been set down also to be followed which are which are um expectations according to the bible i think we i think as a church we have a found a sound foundation in our teaching and preaching and those things should be followed because there are times when we kind of can get off the path or away from our church are you talking about the book of concord well, that might be. Okay. Um, we have inherited. By the way, do you know what today is? Today. Well, it's Saturday, the 17th, 17th. of April. On the, on the 17th of April, in 1521, oh. Luther gave his 
Here I stand. stand. Oh, those who challenged him. Hmm. And it was a difficult moment. I know you have seen one or more films, but I just wanted to remind you about the 500th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's been, a, that was a couple of years ago, was it not already? No, this is the- Oh, oh this is, that was of the- um, Of the, yeah. 95 the, Theses. Right, right. That would be, have taken place in 2017. Right. This is the Here I Stand, which happened about four years later. Let's go on. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Mm. Whoop. Well, that comes down heavy. And then going on with verse 5, my covenant with him, that is with Levi, was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. And there you have a definition of the biblical term, fear God. And to go on then, true instruction was in his, that is Levi's mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. So he not only had pure teaching, his life was in agreement with God's word, and he turned many for, from iniquity by his teaching. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. What a wonderful church that would be, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. This, uh, These verses are full of application to today's church, that God's pastors are to lay hold of God's word in their hearts and to have faith in the God who has given them and to believe. And here, here's the gospel. For those who, who preach and teach in God's name and stay true to God's word, they have a life that is based on God's gift of life it's a, a life of grace because it's a gift. God gave me this life. It's not mine. And in that living a life for him, there is peace. It's a covenant of fear because I fear to go against God. I know. I know the power he holds. You see? I'm being personal about this for a reason, because I can only try to be an example. I know that I am not perfect. My mouth does not always utter only truth. No wrong was found on Levi's lips. He walked with me in peace. It is a, it is a pastor's office to turn people away from that which is wrong and crooked, iniquity. And then verse 7, the lips of a priest or pastor today should guard knowledge. And here I immediately start thinking of what Paul said to Timothy. Same thing. And we are in joy when people seek instruction from us. The Lord has given us his word to study and to be always ready to give an answer to anyone who comes seeking an answer. This is a, a great passage we could use for an ordination or installation of pastors or teachers. And by the way, our called teachers who have been instructed in the Lutheran doctrine and who are able to be rostered, they have this they have this vow, the same vow that we take. Hmm. Well, so here are the expectations. The expectations that God had concerning the descendants of Levi. 
So what expectations does God have for us today? No Let's pride here. Go ahead. D? He has the same expectations from us. They haven't changed. They haven't changed. Right. Living up to those expectations, <laughs> you never feel like you make it. <laughs> it, is, it is work. You can't just shake it out of your sleeve. I'm going to refrain from further personal yeah. things, but you can comment all you want here. I, I'm open. Well, um, there's a lot of lying going on by church people. I mean, we know it because we're looking at it. And, and I'm using that as a word. Uh, um, <coughs> out there in the um, TV land and stuff. And, and we know it, but, you know. But I think some people don't know it. Okay, uh, the ignorance of a great number of, a great percentage of people about the Bible can allow a teacher to twist the words and not be caught at it. Yeah. So I'll tell you what I do. I refuse to watch any religious broadcast on TV. Yeah. Even some of the movies that happen around Easter every year and around Christmas every year, I know they're good and I know they instruct people. But I kind of sit there with my mind on the Bible and say, no, that's not right. They added something there that's not in the Bible. Yeah. Well, you can give poetic license to anyone about anything else but don't you go messing with my Bible. I just, I, you understand what I'm saying to you? Just, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's just a drama. We used uh, sanctified imagination. Yes, uh, I know it, you wanted to, but is it true? Well, not exactly. Well, then it isn't not exactly. You understand what I'm saying? I don't, I didn't tell you not to watch. We remember, remember way, way back 50, 60 years ago, Ben-Hur and the others. It was exciting. It was exciting when Moses touched the ground with his rod and the waters parted. How did Cecil B. DeMille do that? <laughs> he did it with small models. We didn't have, we didn't have CGI then. You know what CGI is? Computer generated, or CGA, uh, computer generated. We didn't have that back. Action type of thing, yeah. Right. So I, I want you to have these high expectations. And gently, if you hear something that doesn't seem to be, you don't go running to someone about false doctrine. You, you go to the pastor or teacher and say, you know, I'm not sure I could be wrong with yeah, didn't you say this? And I thought that the Bible didn't quite say it that way. You can do that privately, please. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, rescue me, Judy, from my marathon <laughs> soliloquy okay. here. Read verse okay. 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Of what corruption had the priest been guilty, according to that verse? Well, does that go back to the first chapter where they were accepting unblemished sacrifices? Well, now, now we're talking about their teaching, Judy. Oh, their teaching, okay. You have turned aside. You have caused many to stumble. Yeah, this word stumble, to, pardon? Yeah, by your instruction, okay. Yeah. And by doing that, you have corrupted the covenant that I made with Levi. 
even though you are legally able to practice as a priest, you're not living up to what I have commanded. So they're not teaching the pure word of God. Doesn't God have the absolute right to require that? Certainly. We're, we're very serious here, aren't we? God and wants to save people. He wants to save people by giving them the message of Christ. He also says, now stop doing what you're doing because it is wrong in my sight. Repent and believe that I have forgiven that. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. Right. Can I interject something here that I was thinking about but didn't want to ask? But maybe there's other people out there who are not uh, knowledgeable either. Certainly. Because Go ahead. You started saying Levi, you know, Levi, et cetera. And, and I have to say, I couldn't place it. I mean, I know there's the Levites and I know, but I just, so I, instead of asking you the basic question, I went on, on Google and Levi was the third son of Jacob and Leah. And uh, this is what this says. And grandfather of Aaron and Moses. Now to you, that's probably common knowledge, but I didn't know it until looking it up now. That's very helpful. Um, sometimes I take for granted what we covered in another time. Now, only only the descendants of Levi could become priests. But yes. first we had to have Aaron. And Aaron, Aaron was the first priest. But yes. he uh, assigned that duty uh, to his, no, that's his grandson, right? Do I have that right? Yes, that's what this says. Mm -hmm. was... So that's, that comes down to us. Mm. And we studied Eli, the priest, when we went into first Samuel and Eli was the foster foster father well, of uh, Samuel. See, that was what I was, I was remembering Samuel, but that isn't Levi or is it the same person? I don't know. No, it isn't. But yeah. I'm saying that the priest Eli was a descendant of Levi. And so he oh, could be okay. a priest. And remember we said that Samuel couldn't be a priest in the, the legal biblical sense of it because he wasn't descended from Eli. Okay, yes, yes. He wasn't descended from Levi. So you have that requirement. Yes. Now, so do I have to be a descendant of Levi to be a pastor? No. Why not? Well, you, you, I, I take that back because we may, we may look back in our heritage and we may be descendants for all we know. I said, do I have to be? Oh. Now, who could change? Who could no. trace a lineage at this point in time? Yeah. No. But even if I could, do I have to be a descendant of someone who was a pastor in a previous oh. many, many decades? No. No. And why not? Well, that's what I was asking you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because it is God who chooses. It is you. You know, oh. when we go to seminary, that does not make us a pastor. Yes. At the end of seminary training, the professors gather together and they ask the question, does anyone have any reason why this man cannot be a pastor? Mm -hmm. and there's no there's silence or there's someone who speaks up and it's a no i have some reservations and i'm sure there's young young men that go to seminary and they've only gone simply because their father was a pastor and they well, thought they had yeah. to be a pastor that used to happen in some families the firstborn oh. it sounds biblical doesn't it yes yeah. it sounds biblical but but it's it's not it's not. It's no, it, the, that requirement is there. Now to go on to the seminary training, and I think we have a few minutes left. We started a little at past quarter after. So pardon my, I have to keep time. Uh, after the seminary is done and, and we have graduated, until and unless we receive a call from a congregation, we're not a pastor. Oh, 
I didn't know that. Well, there are men who get seminary training and for different reasons do not receive a call and they become theologians and writers. Luther, uh, Luther was a pastor, right? He was a priest and a, and, a, and a pastor. But Melanchthon, his right-hand man, until he messed up with some doctrinal problems later on, uh, Philip Melanchthon was not an ordained pastor, though he was very well trained. So there are people who go to seminary and earn a degree, but do not receive a call. And I'll, I'll just be honest, not very often, and it's terrible that it happens at all, that some do not receive a call because of something in their life. And look, at when I say that, we're going by the same standards that have been laid down in the scriptures. So that's what holds us. That's my question five. Yeah. In what respect does the Lord hold today's pastors and teachers to the same standard? Hmm. I'm assuming think, you will agree with me that he does. I was going to say, I think he does because that's part of the responsibility we as members of a church family have in discerning the message that's being preached to us. To, I'm so uh, glad you said that. To uh, make sure that, um, you know, the pastor is staying on the right path. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 is, it behooves the lay people to study the scriptures for their own faith and for the faith of their family and for the instruction in the family. Uh, and also as they serve God in the church to know that, that we are holding our pastors and teachers to that standard. And what is that standard? You know, well, it's what we can say what what Malachi kind of set in our first chapter about teaching the pure word of God. That's the answer. Okay, right. let's keep on doing that. Let let's keep on on doing that. You know, your pastors. Uh, we need your prayers because sometimes we become discouraged and uh, disheartened. And once in a while, we get beat up a little bit. But that's okay. Because we know whom we serve. And we know where we get our, our commission from. And, the, and that's, that's a very humbling thing. What, what can I do when I get up in the morning and the, and there's a sermon to be written. I know a pastor who said, I pray over every word as I read the scriptures of the text I'm going to preach. And he humbled me by saying that because I realized way back that I had thought of it as a mostly intellectual exercise. Oh, please, no, no. This is the spirit of the Lord speaking through those words. It is alive. We should, we should stand with Luther on this 500th anniversary of his Here I Stand speech. We can go back to it and find the words and, and say them unless I am convinced on the basis of reason and the Holy Scriptures. I will not, I cannot we can't. Here I stand. And they whisked him away so that he would not be murdered that night. And he was hidden away in a castle. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I've got time. I'll translate the New Testament from German in I'm from Latin from Latin into German. German. From, from, yeah, I got my languages switched. See though, so that's what he did. 
just a mere little task. <laughs> yeah, it's a little task. Um, all right. Uh, let's pray. Oh, God, you have humbled us by your word. You have called us all to account for what we have offered and how we live our lives. You are always in the audience. Your eyes and your ears see and hear everything. You know our, our paths, and they're not always straight. Forgive us. And cause us to look to the cross where you sacrificed the one perfect lamb, the lamb of God that took away our sin and the sin of the whole world. We thank you for that, for the example of the good pastors and teachers that we have had. And we thank you for bringing us your word today uh, from the prophet Malachi. It is so wonderful to be one of yours called by grace, installed into the, our various callings by your grace and given us everything that we need to fulfill our vows to you. Accept them, O Lord, through the mercies of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.